Um, we'll be recording this session and uh, folks can feel free to use it to share with others. Um, with that, I am going to get started. Um, welcome everybody. We're so excited to talk a little bit about some of the work that Exigy as well as Crop Organization is doing. I'm first going to introduce myself and then pass the mic over to Tara here to introduce herself. Um, my name is Ivy Tang Lei. I am the VP of Growth at Exigy. We are a B Corp using design and technology to improve lives. Um, we work with organizations such as crop organizations who are dedicated to using their platform, their work and commitment to creating positive social impact in the world. Um, today I'm joined by Tara, um, who is the executive director of crop organization. I'd love to give the mic to her to introduce herself. Hi everyone, Tara Lawyer here as Ivy said. Um, I am honored to uh, represent the Crop Organization, also known as Creating Restorative Opportunities and Programs, out here headquartered in Oakland, California, serving the state of California and the reentry system uh, by doing quite a bit of work holistically around this population for individuals returning home from prison. Um, and I just can't wait to take a deeper dive into exactly what we're going to be doing with this incredible platform uh, and moving forward to impact the entire reentry system as we know it today. Thank you, Tara. So um, XGGs has been working with crop organization for um, almost a, a little over a year now, and it's been such a journey. We, we have a lot of fun working together as a team, but we certainly know that the work we're doing is actually attacking a very serious issue um, in the United States, especially when we're thinking about the amount of folks who are incarcerated, um, the lack of support systems uh, that help folks successfully re-enter. Um, before we get into some of those pieces, whether it's legislation or uh, where this this world needs to get to, um, I really want to focus a little bit on you. Um, can you tell us your story, why this matters for you, um, and how your um, how your role came to be, really? I appreciate that, Ivy. Well, how I show up at this in this work and in this space is because it kind of hits a little bit close to home. Um, having been incarcerated myself from the age of 18 to my mid-30s, I served an entire life sentence at the largest female prison in the world, Central California, Central California Women's Facility. Um, and while I was inside, I really, you know, had sort of a lot of motions and experiences while I was there. Um, first and foremost, really focusing on like, how did this happen? How, what was my contribution to it? Really looking at the harm of crime, the impact of crime overall. And, you know, that took a, that was a healing journey, if you will. Um, and what I found was that there was so much healing that needed to be done inside of the prison system. Um, first on sort of a human level, and then mm -hmm. really just like changing and shifting people's minds. So I really became invested in improving the system while I was inside of it. I worked mm -hmm. really closely with the warden and other administrative staff to introduce new rehabilitative programs and higher learning um, programs that are still in existence to today. So I had a passion for leadership roles um, rooted in program design and program development. Um, mm -hmm. And so upon my release in 2017, it was really natural for me to join back with this community that I had been away from for so long. It was my natural mm -hmm. habitat, but it also felt like a foreign land. Being away from 15 years, you can only imagine how much technology had changed, how much the systems were now relying on online platforms, even you scheduling your doctor's appointment. And so mm -hmm. having that digital literacy piece was so crucial um, or else I wasn't going to be able to navigate and reintegrate back into society. So I became really passionate, first and foremost, in the reentry housing, because housing is such a critical piece. A hundred percent. A lot of people think that right when you come home, you just go, go get a job and become a contributing member to society. And there's many, many more obstacles and challenges set in the pathway for individuals returning home than most majority of society even realizes. Um, and so I'm going through this experience. I'm being impacted emotionally, physically you know, mentally with this experience. And yet I couldn't help my professional mind who kept saying, we got to do better. 
The system is Absolutely. broken. People are falling through the cracks. I'm watching peers of mine who had much more social support than I did. They're still falling through the cracks because they don't have the, the wherewithal nor the resources and support to help them tap into the resources that are already in existence to really help them get on their feet. So I come mm -hmm. to this work. I'm so passionate about this work, not only because I lived it and I've seen it, but studies have shown that those individuals most impacted by a problem are closest to creating a solution. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing, and you know, I can go on and on, but I'll stop, is really <laughs> around data, right? Why we're here yes. right now. The reentry system in California in our US nation is so skewed and people cannot really get consistent data upon any of our systems, any of the prisons, any of the jails, any of the parole departments or probation departments. There's not mm -hmm. one centralized area where you can look and say like, what's the average age of someone incarcerated? What's the average income of someone incarcerated? What is the average job that people are getting upon incarceration, upon their release mm -hmm. back into mm -hmm. society? And so we're here to change that uh, with the help mm -hmm. of Exegy designing this platform. It's gonna be big. Yeah, we're super excited. I think the reason why XG's team has been so focusing on so focused on bringing technology to organizations such as yours is that we understand the power that um, technology can have on creating positive um, and impactful um, changes in people's lives, especially those who are living on the margins. I'm really curious if we can go a little bit into why is this moment more important to focus on um, bringing technology for good in the justice involved community um, as we are also seeing technology that has been uh, more oppressive as well. So technology moves fast and the prison system moves slow, but not when it came to mass incarceration. So if we look at just a little bit of history, I think it would help us very much so ground what the issue is today. When I was two years old in 1985, the US prison population was about 500,000 people across the US. By the time I became 18, that number tripled to 1.5 million. And I became that, I became one of those 1.5 million, right? Mm -hmm. It peaked out at 1.65, right? In 2017, by the time I came home, it started to reduce. So we started to see the reduction, the need to reduce people inside of prison. Now, when we look at the, the, the years I was just incarcerated from 2002 to 2017, the wave of technology has gone so high, far above and expansive, yeah. the prison system could have never caught up, right? We're talking about a government controlled entity and industry that is very much so rich, but not rich enough to invest in technology because technology was never designed for good to track and understand how people are moving through the system overall. So we are yep. far behind. And the only yep. way that we can move forward in capturing this technology or in catching the wave, so to speak, is to invest philanthropic dollars, leveraging state dollars, and making sure we're able to create platforms such as this one that we're designing mm -hmm. right now that can be adopted by not just the reentry service providers, not just the government entities, but they can be used also as a resource mm -hmm. eligibility hub for people that are coming home from prison. So everything yeah. needs to be centralized. Yeah, let's um, let's get a little tactical and talk about those platforms that we're building. I think there's the the vision that you you and your team have been. Um, bringing us along and us as like technologists and designers uh, and product managers, like really helping shape them. Um, sure. I think there are a couple of pieces. There's like, as we're thinking about actually creating some of these platforms, we are feeling the segmentation and the disconnection that you are talking about. Everything is completely just like oh, yeah. dispersed in different departments. Um Let's talk a little bit about the vision for these platforms that you see, both yeah. for the data and analytics, as well as the resource and eligibility hub that you had just alluded to. Yeah, I'm going to quickly paint a scenario of what it currently is without any technology assisting someone coming home from prison. 
if I got out of prison today, um, I'm going to need to access transportation services or maybe, you know, some support in that angle. I'm going to need housing. That's another mm -hmm. item that's siloed. I'm going to need employment services, whether that is job training or resume building. I'm going to need medical care, right? I need to see a primary care physician. I may need some legal services if I have custody of my children that I need to get a hold of. I might have restitution and fines that I may need to be dealing with. Um, mm. So if I came home today, it is going to take me at least six months to tackle every area that I just mentioned of, because I can go one place, that one place is not going to have the services that I individually need. And they're going to refer me to 10 other places and I'm going to get on a wait list and I'm going to have to wait for those services to happen, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Most people end up recidivating because they can't get their needs met and they go back to what they know, which is crime. Mm -hmm. The way that this platform is going to alleviate the majority of that is it's going to centralize all services and resources that are currently available across, you know, across California and departments to be able to plug in my profile as a person coming home from prison and everything will pop up that I qualify mm -hmm. for. And right mm -hmm. then and there, just like you could in, in a lot of different, you know, um, applications we see now in, 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 on the internet, mm -hmm. I will be able to not have to have a runaround of going here, there, and everywhere and fall through the cracks, but I'll have a mm -hmm. roadmap. That roadmap is going to tell me everything I need and where I can get my needs met right then and there. The mm -hmm. second piece about this that's so exciting is that once this platform becomes open source and other reentry service providers are using it, the, the client will have multiple touch points and we'll be mm -hmm. able to see exactly who serves them when, how did that service go, how much was invested mm -hmm. in that service, we'll really be able to see the cost of reentry and true time and how we're leveraging already existing state, county, and city yep. programs in addition to nonprofit programs. And so no one will be able to fall through the cracks if everyone utilizes the platform and we have a centralized informational hub about yep. how the clients are doing. We'll be able to track them in, in, in what they need Right. Because the only thing that formerly incarcerated people have in common is that they're formerly incarcerated. Every single mm. person, is unique circumstance, circumstances are very unique. And mm. the ultimate, the ultimate uh, message I can't emphasize enough here is this platform is going to create safer communities because we're going to ensure that who becomes your neighbor, who becomes my neighbor is someone mm. that is ready and capable and resourced up enough to be able to be a contributing member of society and not stuck in survival mode where they have to make ends meet any way they know how. Yeah. And while they're doing all of that, they're thinking about how to find a place to live permanently, especially if some of these services are, are asking for um, mailing address or yeah. like contact information. Yeah. Um, I think as we're thinking about building a technology alongside your team, or we're, we're very focused on creating the experience in a way that um, folks who have not touched technology for decades sometimes yeah. are able to intuitively use it. Um, I want to try a little bit into the importance of folks like you and your team creating this technology for the reentry community versus some of the other attempts that I think um, we are seeing in the world like that's a little bit more of the scary side right like we have folks who know the cost of um uh, incarceration but we don't know the cost to allow someone to successfully re-enter it's almost like we're so focused on making <laughs> incarceration efficient um but we're not really good on the other human side of using it for for um, allowing second chances, allowing families and um, human um, factors to be reintroduced into a person once they are uh, re-entered. Yeah, and I think that that's the reason why in this first phase of, of building out this platform, because our program Ready for Life is designed holistically, it is designed um, 
to ensure that every aspect of reentry that needs to be addressed is done underneath one umbrella, under our mm-hmm. roof, right? Underneath mm-hmm. our career campus. So people are getting 12 months of housing. They're getting $1,000 a month stipend. They're getting digital literacy and financial literacy. They're receiving leadership for life training, which is like a mindset makeover, really mindset development, shifting mm-hmm. from like institution silo thinking um, into career mindsets, um, and then upskilling them into technology, right? Into tech skilled mm-hmm. positions. We're talking UX design, we're talking sales. Um, and then before they, once they complete, they're going into sort of internships, apprenticeships, working full-time with employers, making a livable mm-hmm. wage, um, yep. before we assist them in transitioning from transitions, which is permanent housing solutions. Um, and so when someone is coming home from reentry, we recognize that they have to go and piecemeal their services together, um, but the platform is going to mimic exactly what we do here underneath one hub mm-hmm. across California, right? So yep. we, it will be beyond just like having one person to do everything they could underneath one hub because that may not that may not be sustainable up until for mm-hmm. some time. Even though we we take on that challenge and we know that we can do it for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there's a lot of work. There's, there's a lot of work. But for the existing nonprofits that are doing great work at trying to assist people reintegrate, this platform will help them see exactly how they want to allocate their resources and support services to each individual versus duplicating or not giving enough because they'll be able to see this client received this, that, Mm -hmm. and another. Mm -hmm. They got their social security, they got their Medi-Cal, instead of repeating Mm -hmm. it and clogging, clogging up the system. And the application processes, right? Yeah. You'll be able to see so, what waiting list they're on, and you'll be able to see what the housing pool looks like for them as a client. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want to kind of like summarize the structure because I think we talked a little bit about the foundation of um, the world we, the country we live in today, um, what CROP is doing. Uh, so, CROP organization has a physical campus right now in West Oakland. And when folks who are actively incarcerated are that are about to be released, they apply to become part of the crop fellow. That's and nice. those that fellowship is part of the pro, uh, Ready for Life program that you all have, where we are giving them 12 months of housing, as well as the supportive, holistic, comprehensive programs such as mental health and some of the other leadership development and just digital literacy pieces are being built and being tracked. That's the important piece. Now that we know that we can track some of these pieces, then we can kind of look back and say what went well, what didn't, what needs more funding. How do we advocate more funding moving forward? Um, Correct. This feels like such a no brainer. And I want to talk about, why this has taken so long? Well, um, let's just be honest. Um, government funding is very restrictive. Um, there's, there's very little government sources that allow for innovation. And what we know is that what currently exists needs new blood, new creativity, something radical to really shift from what we've been doing to what we need to do. The Mm -hmm. the studies are there, even though the data is not painting a clear enough picture, our recidivism rates are still way too high. And we're we're not digging deep enough to see how technology can play such a pivotal role in reducing that number, because we're not leveraging the power of technology to to help us paint a new picture. Um, Because government funding is so restrictive, it does not allow for us to test a lot of pilots. Um, we did receive a remarkable $27 million grant from the California Workforce Development Board, which allows us to pilot this holistic program, Ready for Life, which includes all the supportive services, case management, digital literacy, 12 months of housing, a monthly stipend, employment readiness, career upskilling, employment placements, 
and long-term housing solutions all under one, right? We know a person needs all of that to really be able to contribute greatly to their, to their community. Um, but philanthropy, individual donors is really what drives innovation because what I have found in my career is that when you create a solution, which we're doing now, we have a solution, mm -hmm. right? Which is already working. And you take that solution to government, to legislators, and you say, look at what we designed, look at how it's working, look at the evaluation reports. They will mm -hmm. say, wow, thank you for doing that. We are now going to fund it more because we see it's working and it's going to cost us significantly less than it costs to incarcerate someone for one year, right? Mm -hmm. Um, why technology? Because it is the future of work. And we also mm -hmm. know that this population, people who are incarcerated are most likely coming from black and brown BIPOC communities. Mm -hmm. um, this marginalized sector of the world is the last in line to really enter tech, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, it's just, it's just what it is. So this gives an opportunity to tap to a talent pool that is hungry hungry mm -hmm. and driven to prove they are better and bigger than their past mistakes. Mm -hmm. And we have seen some early reports come out on the type of employees that are able to be showcased if they're formally incarcerated. They mm -hmm. are much more dedicated, harder workers, and stay with a company longer. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll go above and beyond they have a lot to prove. Um, and so what we believe, what we believe is the work ethic of our fellows will be so profound if given one chance uh, at moving into a technology company and with the skills that are needed right now, um, yeah. being able to showcase that at a company is paramount. Yeah, that's, the game, that's, the, that's the game changer there. Yeah. I, um, I've got two more questions left and I want to ensure that the folks who are joining today can also put in their questions. We have some time left at the end. Um, so, uh, just a little reminder for folks who are attending when it comes down to game changers, I want to, you know, really dial up the possibility of having data be able to inform some of the legislative funding or philanthropic funding, but oh, yeah. it really, it can also help debunk a lot of myths that people use as narratives um, that unfortunately has been amplified by some news outlets to really create this scary world that we live in. Um, and that puts marginalized community even further at risk um, of falling through safety nets this game changer is also a narrative change at the end of the day. Let's talk a little bit about what that means for funders, uh, for us as a community, uh, and really thinking about what it means for us to be sharing this story here today. Yeah, I think it starts absolutely with our culture. Um, you know, the culture in the US is absolutely um, punitive. And what we find is that, I mean, if you break it down and just even think about, you know, a parent who is um, disciplining their child, you either mm -hmm. take something away from them or you put them on time out. And we do that to our adults. But what was taking place inside of prison for so long was the treating, when you treat someone like an animal, they will behave like an animal. And what we were not seeing was dignity integrity, mm. showing somebody their worth by treating them as a human being that made a mistake, right? And we believe that everyone deserves second chances because not everyone gets it right on the first try. And not everyone was raised with the same resources and the same guidance that is going to help gear them towards making great responsible choices. So we first approach this with that mindset. And we really reflect on the stories, the success stories, even my own story, I'm not special, right? It was people's kindness. It was their encouragement. 
It was them opening doors and I had, I accepted that invitation and walked through it. So while my, my past of criminal activity really brings me a lot of disappointment, I have an opportunity to give back to the community in such a way that impacts people and changes hearts, mm -hmm. and changes lives and helps people change their mind on how we look at just the stranger walking down the street or the unhoused neighbor that has an encampment underneath the bridge, right? We have mm -hmm. to really begin thinking, you know, we are each other's responsibility to some extent. And if you look at some of these other countries and the manner in which they sort of treat and view their mm -hmm. incarcerated populations, they recognize that as a society, somewhere along the line, they failed them versus saying you failed us. And in America, mm -hmm. we do say you failed us. You failed us and now you, you messed up. Now you've got to lie in the bed that, that you made. And yet we mm -hmm. still have high expectations of how they mm -hmm. should show up back into society with those challenges and with those obstacles. We still want you to get a job. We still want you to pay your taxes. We really don't care if your children don't have food to eat. You should be doing that. And this is the bed and you've got to lie in it. So mm -hmm. like, when we see the true magic of how people can remarkably shift their lives and become leaders that are contributing in big, big ways to the community. It's all about the narrative change, right? Mm -hmm. Not everyone that has ever been incarcerated should be written off as trash or ostracized mm -hmm. and socially expelled, right? Mm -hmm. I think we all can relate to having made a bad choice, a bad mistake, having to make take, take responsibility, acknowledge mm -hmm. the hurt, acknowledge the harm, and really put our best foot forward. Narrative change is paramount. Even in the mm -hmm. conversations that you're having with family, with friends, at a restaurant mm -hmm. with a stranger, you can always share little tidbits about success stories of how people are transforming their lives because that's what we're in the mm -hmm. business of doing, is making sure they have the resources, they have the open door so that they can walk through it. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful. Thank you. Tara, for everything you and your team um, do every single day. Um, let's talk a little bit about what, where we are with the pilot. Um, I think we just shared a prototype that is very prototype for uh, the um, resource and eligibility hub. We also have this ongoing partnership to build the data and analytics platform while we are still allowing you all to work with the fellows. And there's this constant um want to like collect every movement and every data. Um, and then there's the reality of like, what data is too much data or how, or it, what data is more powerful than other data? So yeah. where are we with the pilot today? I mean, we're using it, right? Um, our fellows across Los Angeles and Oakland are in their current first pillar of leadership for life. Um, they are learning so much uh, about themselves and really pushing their sort of core values beyond what they ever imagined or maybe whatever they've been exposed to in the past because prison definitely ain't, does not have good value systems set up right i mean everything is the opposite there what what's right out here is wrong in there and vice versa mm -hmm. um, so really helping people sort of break down some of those old belief systems is really key but what the platform right now is allowing us to do is not only our case management system and really collecting where people's starting point is, but we're also able to see every touch point that they're going through with our team. So we have a team of coaches, we have a reentry team, we have uh, instructors. Um, and so making sure that we're really seeing the resources that are poured into each and every one of our fellows. I mean, this platform is creating that opportunity for us right now. Yeah. There's the folks who are um, supporting the fellows. And mm -hmm. then we are also at the same time planting seeds for the fellows portal. Yeah. Which allows the fellows to tell their side of the story. Can That's you tell right. us more about that? Okay. So there are a lot of social solutions out there, right? Um, yeah. When it comes to case management, collecting data, your DAP notes, and sort of from a social, you know, worker perspective, like just 
How do you manage your cases, your caseloads? Um, but often, and what we know to be true, we rarely capture the voice of the client themselves. That's right. I mean, this is this is why it's important because I can tell I can tell the governor, I can tell my state legislators, I can tell anyone how many hours I poured into a human being, how much resources and funding we poured into them. But at the end of the day, can they communicate back to you that what you provided them actually helped? Mm -hmm. We rarely see that. And that's really important. The perspective from a fellow on their perceived success is more important than us saying we've been successful. Mm. Does that make sense? Because I can, I can give you everything in the world, but if you felt like it didn't help, then we need to go back and we need to iterate and we need to look at what actually is needed because we had a great team meeting earlier today and we're all like, well, in my past experience in my professional experience in my lived experience, and quite honestly, Ivy, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It's obsolete today because just like that in the world of tech, what existed six months ago has become obsolete today. So we need to stay present with each and every one of our client and always be flexible enough to iterate, change, and shift the development of our program and this platform so that it's responsive to the needs of people today. Mm -hmm. We never want to repeat what happened and what has happened with our criminal justice system and stay stagnant in processes Mm -hmm. and systems. That's why that piece is so incredibly important because it helps Mm -hmm almost like AI, it learns, the platform will Mm -hmm. learn along with the program. Yeah. I think there's like the the phrase like that people coined human centered um, design, but really I think our team took so like really together advocated for a lot of time spent with the organization and with folks who will be part of the fellow portal and the program to like, get their thoughts into ensuring that this works, this is easy to use, the data will be accurate, and that we are actively at the same time looking at them at real time and saying, Absolutely. wow, is this is this actually trending um, the way that we expect it to? That's incredibly, incredibly powerful. And um, as someone who has been, uh, live, who lived in the United States for over 20 years undocumented, I just feel the peace around like, I just wish someone would ask me, right? Like, how I want the solutions to work um, and to debunk a lot of that myth that we see out there. Um, and there's a layer of trust and security that comes right. with having folks with lived experiences being right. part of the solution. How does your team currently integrate that alongside hosting the fellowship program? It's very simple. We don't objectify anyone. What that means is that I don't say to any of my fellows that you can't do something because you have a criminal record. Mm -hmm. If anything, if they want to do it, we're going to stand behind them, fuel the resources Mm -hmm. for their own engines to let them go and accomplish Mm -hmm. some of their most audacious goals because we know that they can do it. It's a very simple formula. I just wish everybody knew that. (laughs) Um, we are running up to the last five minutes of our time together Um, Mm. we are going to pass some resources uh, in the live chat and also making one more call to action for folks who may have questions Um, we are also going to share with you our LinkedIn um, profile so you can connect with us offline um and this is, and I'm writing in the chat for folks who are interested, um, Ethan, who is also on the call today from the Exigy team, will be posting the live stream to be more accessible as well, post this session. Um, in the last couple minutes, Tara, what do you want people to do to support crop organization and all the wonderful things we talked about? Gossip about us, spread the word. Uh, you know, go to the top of the hill and scream it loud and clear that we are set on a path to disrupt the reentry system in a new way, setting a new standard, new expectations for us to meet 
so that we can impact the community, make it safer, and, and really help people keep their families together. Family sustainable wages is everything. Um, visit our website, donate, spread the word, help us network, connect us to like-minded employers. We're gonna have an incredible talent pool in just a matter of months. And I think you, you know, people are going to want to get in line for this incredible, this incredible pool yeah. of talent. Yeah. And if anyone is in Oakland, there's a beautiful campus there yeah. um, that is built for this program. Um, I visited several times myself and I just, every time I walk in, it's, it's a pool of energy that you just dive into. Um, there are, there are two cohorts right now in LA and Oakland. Um, right. Are they going to continue to uh, move forward in recruiting? What does it look like in terms of next steps? Our application is open for the next cohort, which is scheduled to start in October. Um, the mm -hmm. current cohorts that are in classrooms um, are already, you know, almost into career upskilling um, next month. Oh, my God, it's already May. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have sort of a night school set up out in Los Angeles for individuals that have been out in the community a little bit longer. The career mm -hmm. campus is really the, that work-life sort of balance here where they're able to, you know, live and also um, go to work. And mm -hmm. education, um, and so it's it's all a one-stop shop, wraparound services under one umbrella, and that was designed so that we can really analyze the reentry system and how siloed it has been, and what actually happens to an individual if they can get all their needs met in one place. You may have lost Ivy just a little bit. Or maybe it was me. Can you guys still hear me? Oh, <laughs> I think you have them. Well, I can probably guess what Ivy would have said. She probably would have said something along, this has been amazing. Please follow our LinkedIn. Please follow all of the things <laughs> back. I was trying to guess what you would normally say. I said, if, this was, if I was Ivy, please follow us on LinkedIn. <laughs> I like called it that the internet may go out because the weather's not that great in the Bay. <laughs> in the last three minutes, it gets me. So I'm sure, oh yeah, I'm sure you said some wonderful things around like what's next. Um, yes. So with the last couple of minutes left, um, again, one more call to action for folks who are here and who have immediate questions for us. Um, we are now in the MVP and prototyping stage with um, the crop organization. And we're just super duper excited for us to introduce it and hopefully we'll host a demo. So please, you know, keep an eye out for what that demo may possibly look like because the more we can get folks to support the ecosystem of the work that we're trying to do, the more I think funders uh, and legislators are beginning to see the value of it. Um, and it's going to take so much uh, more than just the two organizations here, but the entire community and country, really. Um, thank you, everybody. Tara, do you have anything else you'd like to wrap up on? I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful that we had some space to really showcase our work. Um, I mean, the, the heart of this program is in the fellow's chest. It's beating. They're alive. They are baking cookies after 30 years. <laughs> they are learning how to reintegrate back into their families. They're excited yeah. about the, the, the prospect of like having a career versus a job uh, in you know, entry level, which is what they thought they would have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so really setting that bar a little bit high for them to really swing high is like a dream yeah. come true to watch unravel. And I mean, just to watch unfold rather and, and to see, you know, people feeling incredibly um, supported. Um, I see your question, how do we support people with getting access to mobile devices to help them, to help support them? So we do have a couple of programs, um, you know, through the government that allows people to get mobile devices. Um, if they prefer to 
purchase their own device, we can uh, give them an advance in their stipend, purchase a mobile device for them, and then they're able to sort of budget um, their funding that they get from us uh, to pay for it. So yeah. we're all about uh, agency and allowing people to make decisions based upon the resources that they have and facilitate you know, money management uh, principles into all of our policies and transactions that support the uh, fellow themselves. It's a great question. Yeah. Well, we're here to talk more. Um, connect with us on LinkedIn, like our pages, uh, company pages for regular updates. And then if anyone would like to set up one-on-one -on -one call, we'll be here. Um, thank you everyone for attending. My heart is full. I hope you all are as well. And we're just so grateful for everyone to take time out of their day to join us. Um, have a great rest of your week.